This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cootie, and Huskers Radio Network analyst, Jeremiah Searles. Welcome back into another edition of the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza with Jeremiah Searles. I'm Jessica Cootie, and disappointing week for you hunting. Did I just not like get to a deer? Rub salt in the wounds. Salt <laughs> in the wounds, Jessica. No, I did not shoot a deer. Very unhappy about it, but there's still late season bow season, and it's now chase the winged devils of uh, ducks and geese. We talked about making this a hunting episode. How are we going to have a hunting podcast if you can't kill anything? Oh, I, t I told my wife, I was like, this was older days. Our family died of starvation, so I apologize. <laughs> but luckily enough, the grocery store still exists. All right, well, here we are. Your um, favorite week, your favorite week because it's Thanksgiving, but also. We're playing the number two, your second favorite team in all of college football. <laughs> Iowa hate week is fully upon <laughs> us. Um, yeah, big week. You know, I think that everything, records go out the window for rivalry week. First of all, it's my favorite week of college football of the year. You know, rivalry week is, in my opinion, better than championship weeks a lot of the time. So really exciting to go. And Huskers get another shot at Iowa where every game the last few years has just been coming down to the wire. And... You know, they found a way to win it at the end, and we just hope that this may be our time to get a chance to win it at the end, you know. So really exciting for all involved. Uh, seniors get to go out on one more chance here and try and beat Iowa as a standoff. So a lot to play for in this game. All right, well, before we dive more into your hatred of Iowa, uh, another just devastating loss, and Nebraska controlled it the whole time against Wisconsin. Wisconsin makes the big plays at the end to, to come away with a victory. Just absolutely gut-wrenching once again uh, for these guys that they couldn't find a way to, to come out on the, the right end of this one. Yeah, you know, a lot of it stems back to our inability to control the ball in the second half. You know, I thought that at times we did a really nice job with ball control, you know, putting some drives together. But there at the second half and we had the lead and we needed to get a first down. And, uh, you know, we threw the ball some incompletes and didn't get that, that, fir that last first down, you know, is always the hardest one to get. And once we didn't get that and we punted it back to Wisconsin, you know, there was that deep part in my brain that's like, no, this can't actually happen. But... You know, it, it happened again. Wisconsin made some plays there down the stretch. The big running back tight end, or the big running back catch on the sideline there, and then finished it off in the end zone. Um, you know, credit to them for showing up and making a moment. But it's just accumulation of everything we've talked about, right? End of game, defense is tired. They played a lot of snaps throughout not just the game, throughout the year. And then our offense's inability to control the ball on the ground. Um, in the fourth quarter was really what kind of accumulated to that loss. Yeah, and again, you know, not necessarily wanting to, to dive into a lot of the same things that we've talked I about for, for several weeks, but um, Oscars just couldn't run the football and, and couldn't get anything going on the ground. And, and Casey Thompson was a leading rusher, I think 65 total yards, and I think he had 33 of them. And he did show some, some good runs and, and picked up some good yards in, in that regard. But when they couldn't get anything going of handing the football off to Anthony Grant in these types of games, it's just really troublesome. Yeah, I mean, look at how Michigan is winning games. Look at Illinois is winning games. You know, it's on the backs of the running backs and the offensive line. When you get to November in the Big Ten, it's no longer about throwing the ball over the yard. You know, it's about controlling clock, bad weather football games, cold weather games of who can grind it out on the ground, time of possession. It's all so important when you look at how you build your football team. And that's why Brett Bielma has success. That's why those teams have success of how they built their teams to be a run-first team. Because when it does get times like this and you're not having a lot of success in the past game, it just puts so much stress on your defense. And so this week's another example. You know, Iowa is not what I would call a stellar offense, but they have a fantastic defense. And if you allow them to control the clock and allow them to run the football on offense, like that defense is really good at limiting your entire possession. So, you know, Wisconsin did it. I think Iowa's going to try and do it. They're going to try and force us into passing the football and not allow us to get the run game going and make us one-dimensional with throwing the football. And if that's the case, we're going to struggle again. All right. So, you know, I, I wanted to dive into this with you, too. What goes into building that offensive line, the, the lines that you're talking about? It's not just something that is fixed in a spring and bringing a couple guys in. I mean, it takes years to develop that kind of offensive line, right? Yeah. I mean, offensive line play is built over the course of 
two or three years. You know, you want to bring in guys that grow together, that live together, that work together on the scout team and work together on the second team. And then when they get their moment to play next to each other for the first time, you know, they're ready. They're gone. They've been developed in the weight room. They've been developed through practice, playing against higher competition when they were freshmen and sophomores. And then when they get to junior or senior year, it's ready to play. Um, you know, but the problem is that has not been the case for Nebraska. All these recruits that we bring in, the Teddy Brahaskas, the Turner Corcorans, the Henry Lutovskis that are young players are forced into action right away. And that's really hard for a young player to develop the strength and physicality over that he needs over time to be ready to go out there and not just survive, but to go out there and dominate. And that's what you're seeing from programs like Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio State. Like, these players are not first-year players out there. They're multi-year starters, but they've started for two years or three years, and they spent at least two years on the development squad. And so, yeah, you can go out and you can get JUCO guys and you can get transfer guys, but, you know, you have to build from within, especially on the interior of offense and defensive lines. Get guys in, develop them within the system, develop them within the weight room, and then allow them to go out there and perform, or else it's just really hard because you kind of get stuck in this vicious cycle of playing young guys, underdeveloped players physically. They get good by their senior year, but then it's just kind of off into another piece of it. So um, it's just a hard thing for a lot of people to, to understand, but, you know, in the great programs build from within. So take me back to when, you know, you were kind of going through this, the recruiting process and as an offensive lineman recruit, what mm -hmm. you're looking for – where you want to go play because I know Nebraska used to be known for the pipeline obviously and it used to be the place to, to want to be an offensive lineman so so what goes into that when you're a young offensive line recruit where you're looking to want to play you know honestly one of the things I looked at was how many old linemen do they put in the NFL uh, as a young player you want to play in the NFL as a high school kid you want to play in the NFL college is like obviously great and you love the ability to do it but your goal is to ultimately go play in the NFL so you, know, you look at, hey, what offensive lineman pedigree have they had of putting guys in the NFL? What has this old line coach done with putting guys in the NFL? And then the other piece of it, you look at, you know, what is in front of me? How many guys are in the room? And do I have a chance to play early? And you don't know it, but every coach can tell you you should play early. But then you get there and realize you, you're not ready to. You need to develop. Um, you know, but you look into all those things. And so I know I looked and saw that there was a, a starter ahead of me that was a junior that year. He's going to be a senior the next year. And then I would have a chance to compete my second year for a starting job, which is what happened. Um, and end up winning that starting job. But, you know, you look at a lot of different things, but I think the number one thing you look at is what has that coach done for players going to the NFL, and then also what does the strength program look like? That was a big thing for me is what is, this, what is this strength program geared towards? Is it geared towards development? Is it geared towards speed? Is it geared towards strength? And, um, you know, we're going to probably have a new strength coach next year, so that's going to change with the philosophies of how everything goes. So, you know, all of that goes into the development side of it, just to be said, but it all came down to really just fit and what I loved about the school. You know, one thing about, I know the transfer portal wasn't as big when you were playing, but it's, it's huge now, and it seems like to me, and I, I could just be completely off on this, but it seems like when, when you start looking at the guys that are entering the portal, not a lot of the top offensive linemen in, the, in playing college football are the ones that are going to the portal. I mean, you might see wide receivers, quarterbacks that go on, but it doesn't seem like a lot of the, the really good offensive linemen actually enter the portal. Why is that? Do you feel like that's valid, and why is that? Because when you find them, you don't let them go. It's the mm -hmm. same reason in the NFL when you find a tackle specifically um, that when it, it's the specifically like the starting tackle, you pay him a bunch of money, you never let him out of the building. Mm -hmm. because they're hard to find. I mean, the edge rushers are getting better and better at every level, and it's harder and harder to find big, athletic offensive linemen that can keep up with those guys. And so the guys that are going into the portal as offensive linemen are usually guys that have gotten beat out, or they're older guys that a, a younger players come in that they're more excited about the future than they are with the old, grizzled vet. And so you're seeing kind of them go into it. But, you know, there's just not – there's too much need. There's too much need for offensive linemen – that if you're good enough to play and start in a Power 5 program, you're not going to hit the transfer portal because you're starting. Right. And I think that's a big piece of it. And so I think that's why you haven't seen the big blockbuster portal moves like it, quarterback or receiver, because they're, A, we're just not that important unless you need <laughs> us, and B, like there's just not a lot of big names out there. Yeah, and, and too, it could go back to, as you mentioned, like you, you get a group and they come in together and then a lot of times you want to stick together, right? And I don't think last year did, did Nebraska have an offensive lineman in last year's 
recruiting class, you were on signing day. I don't no, believe they did. No, we didn't. So, we didn't have one, which blew my mind. So how much does that hurt, too, that you're not getting groups together that are going through this thing together as well? Yeah, it's really hard. You know, I was best friends with my O-line group that came in. It was me, Brent Qualley, Spencer Long, Cole Penzik, um, Nick Ash. I mean, we all did everything together. We grew up together. We became young men together. We became adults. And that was just in the weight room. It was on the field. It was everything. And you created this bond of just brotherhood, especially in that position. And when you don't have an entire class like that, like you're going to miss out on that. And you know, when you only have one senior that's starting or two seniors that are starting, like that's a hard thing. You want to have two or three seniors starting every single year that you have and then you rotate the rest of the guys in and then it's the next senior class and the next senior class and so when you have a whole recruiting class that didn't even sign an offensive lineman that's really worrisome to me um, you know and it's something that I think we need to get addressed and fixed right away and like I said it's not easy to sign a lineman because the good ones get gobbled up quickly but that's where I talk about the inside development you know guys like myself I was a three-star recruit coming out of high school you know guys like Spencer Long who's a converted D lineman same with Cole Pensick you know, I think of guys like Jake Cotton, who were all converted, the guys that were lower star recruits, Brent Qualley, three-star recruit, that we developed ourselves into starting Big Ten offensive linemen and then NFL offensive linemen. But all of that was through the development of in-house stuff. James Dobson, Barney Cotton, John Garrison, Tim Beck, those things just helping us develop as young players so that by the time we were in our second and third year, we were ready to go out and play. You just aren't seeing that in this regime right now through Mike Riley, through Scott Frost, and that's something that with the new head coach, we really have to get changed is our internal development of offensive linemen. All right. I, just, I took you down the weeds there, but I, th I thought that you was did. interesting. You did. Sorry. I, no, I mean, because, again, and not wanting to, to bash anybody, and, and this, no. is a, this is a close group, and I think, you know, there just have been – a little bit depleted with injuries, with Nuri suspension. I mean, they've been hit really hard. But, you know, with people asking, oh, I, you, I get that question a lot. Well, how do you fix the offensive line? Well, it's not an overnight fix. It's not even an over month fix. It, I mean, it just takes time to build the dominant offensive lines. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I'm not bashing on this line at all. And they'd be the first to tell you, I'd hope they'd be the first to say, like, yeah, it hasn't been good enough. You know, that's the first thing you have to admit as a player. When things aren't going well, like, yeah, it's, it's not good enough. And I, but if anyone on that line right now looked me in the eye and said that they were playing good enough, I'd tell them to reevaluate themselves because I've been there. I've been where I haven't been playing good enough. You know, and so, yeah, it's something that has to get looked at by from player to coach to head coach to, to AD of how are we not getting this right of developing offensive linemen because as you're seeing in the Big Ten, you cannot win without good offensive lines. Family traditions mean great food. With treasured Italian family recipes passed down for generations, Valentino's has become Nebraska's classic Italian tradition for 65 years. Okay, so let's um, move on. Iowa, why do you hate Iowa so much? They're just cocky <laughs> SOBs, man. Like, they are. And, like, it's so frustrating because there's no, like, argument back that I have because the last time we beat them was 2014. I want to say, you know, so it's one of those things where it's like every time I want to talk trash, and they're like, yeah, okay, well, when you win next time, let us know. You know, but they're, they were always known as like, we used to refer to them as little brother. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, little brother over there um, in Iowa. But right now we're little, we're little red brothers, they call us, and my friends call us in the league. And it really started for me when I got into the NFL and played with a bunch of Hawkeyes. You know, when you play with guys that are on other teams, the rivalry in the locker room gets a little gets a little excited. You know, money gets thrown around a little bit, but pride, wearing T-shirts and that kind of fun stuff. And I played with a lot of hot guys in Minnesota. I played with some in Buffalo. You know, I'm friends with George Kittle, and these guys just get after me every single time we play. And I'm just so ready to send them a text one time and be like, shut up. <laughs> just shut up and wear it. Shut up. Well, I mean... Iowa does what they, they do, right? And I did this stupid amount of math the other night <laughs> trying to figure out how much, you know, off, Iowa does not score a lot of points offensively, right? And a lot of times when they're putting up the points, it's, it's courtesy of their defense, either pick sixes, fumble returns, or it's come from a block punt or takeaway. What have you seen? Why is the offense not very good for Iowa? The offense for Iowa is not very good because of offensive line play. Um, they have not had great offensive line play, which, which is, is not, surprising. Which is rare for Iowa, right? Which is surprising for Iowa. I mean, you look at Iowa over the course of the last decade, you know, it seems like every year they have a top three rounder. 
You know, they had Brandon Sheriff, and then they had Tristan Wirfs, and then they had Ike Bucker, you know, and they've had Tyler Lindenbaum. And so, you know, to see an Iowa offensive line that doesn't have a, a true, like, day one, day two pick uh, up front, and let alone, I don't think they have a day three pick on that offensive line right now. And they're a young group, but, you know, they've really, really had problems protecting the quarterback, especially when guys have sent pressure. When you send pressure against a team, they really struggle to pick up twists and stunts. So that's something that Nebraska has done quite a bit. But what they've done better over the last four weeks and why they've started having more success is because they've started winning on first down. They've started having four-plus yard plays on first down, keeping themselves out of the third and eight-plus and more into the third and threes and the third and fives and having the ability to convert those easier throws because Spencer Petrus in this offensive line, much like ours, is not built to take a seven-step drop and have these long developing routes down the field. Okay, on the flip side of that, what makes the Iowa defense so good? Their coverage. They are so good at that zone coverage that they play in the back end, and they are one of the best in the country at creating turnovers. You know, they are ball hawks. A lot of that is because they're really good at creating pressure with four, so they're able to keep a lot of guys back in that coverage, that zone coverage scheme. And, you know, a lot of teams have gone and made it so that they're basically playing significantly just man coverage. But I think that the number one thing that they do is they play a lot of zone coverage. And so it's different than most quarterbacks see is they're playing this zone and so there's a window that you think you can fit a ball into but they're just so comfortable in their system that that window closes very quickly and that's why they do have so many back, um, interceptions on the year and you know this is a team that I think that if this if this team if the Iowa's offense averaged 17 points a game they may be more like a nine win team yeah. because of how good this defense is you know and, and so that's why it's going to be so important that we're able to score points because if we can score 20 points we might win this game you know like that's the type of game it's going to be it's going to be a classic november big 10 football slugfest of who's going to be the race to 21 points and you know i think that with our ability and our big play ability if we can keep casey thompson clean trey palmer and marks washington and those guys can get behind this defense as long as we give them time and then offensive or on the flip side nebraska's defense if we can stop the run on first and second down i really like our chances of getting to spencer petrus and this quarterback on third down okay so you kind of dove into that a little bit matchups that nebraska could maybe exploit offensively where we're working uh working the huskers maybe have some success offensively yeah you know i think offensively um i think Trey Palmer really is going to be a guy that's going to get a lot of attention. So, you know, I think getting a guy like Travis Volkolek over the middle continually involved, getting guys like Alante Brown in the screen game, you know, quick screen game to the outside and making these zone coverage corners come press up a little bit more instead of just sitting back in that comfy zone, make them get up and take some easy yards. You know, if he's going to play a seven-man bump, a uh, seven-man buffer, throw it out there to Trey Palmer or Alante Brown or one of those guys and let him make that guy miss and go gain 12. You know, so I like our outside matchup on our receivers um, for offensively. For our defense, I really like our interior matchups between Ty Robinson and Colton Feast and Garrett Nelson and Caleb Tanner against that Iowa offensive line. You know, I think that they will be able to get after them and be able to really put pressure on them. But again, it's going to be a lot of dependent on how Ernest Hausman and how Luke Reimer can help in that run coverage. They can get in there, stuff the A-gaps, and make this run game essentially a little bit more non-existent than it has been in the last few weeks for Iowa. Then we give ourselves a really good chance defensively. I just did a, a long interview with Caleb Tanner for a Cornhusker conversation, and, and he talked about this game still means a lot to this team, even mm. despite, again, you know, walking off the field disappointed every week for the last several and, and being so close to winning and, and even leaving last week, their last home game, being so close to, to walking a, away with a win. But they have a huge opportunity here. And he also talked about, you know, not only for him and this senior class to have a win and walk off the field the last time wearing the N with, a, with an N, a win wearing the N, but also for some of these young guys to help build for the future. And, and you've mentioned this, how big a win is, how much better a win is heading into an offseason than a loss is. Yeah, he nailed it. You know, it's not only about the legacy you want to live as a senior. It's about how do you want to propel the next generation of Husker seniors into next year with a loss or a win? Easy answer. Obviously a win. You know, I think there's also something about spoiling Iowa's Big Ten hopes a little yes. bit, too. Yes. You know, like they have this little glimmer of like, if we can win and this guy wins and that guy wins, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's time to we can be like, oh, yeah, we can go to the Big Ten championship. No, 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 no. 
let Nebraska be the one that just poo poos all over that. You know, that would be fantastic. It's just like Iowa makes this late run, and then Nebraska just comes in, beats them at home in Kinnick Stadium to make them go home too and not go to the Big Ten Championship. Sign me up for that. All right, three big keys. Uh, yeah, number one key is going to be on defense, win on first and second down, make sure that uh, you're keeping them in third and long. Um, number two, I think offensively, is no three and outs or limit your amount of three and outs. You know, I think this is a game that you cannot go out there and have quick time of possession, so you got to make sure you limit your number of three and outs, and then number three is going to be field position. Um, again, it's Big Ten football in November. Flip the field when you can, make the other team go the distance, and both these offenses have struggled at times, so I think Iowa's going to be very similar to, hey, if we can pin them back there at the 10 and make them go 90, we like our chances of them making a mistake or them not being able to get down. Same thing with me. I think if Nebraska can pin them inside the 10 and make them go 90 every single time, this offense isn't built for that. So uh, I think those are your keys to try and get away with the victory. Players to watch? I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, I think the player to watch on an offense is going to be Marcus Washington and Alante Brown. Um, I think those two guys are dudes that are going to have to have big games to help free up some Trey Palmer stuff. And then on defense, I really want to see Colton Feast and Ty Robinson control this interior line of scrimmage. I want to watch those two defensive linemen take their time and really just to have a really solid outing because those two guys will be pivotal into that first key that I just mentioned. Michigan or Ohio State? Oh, I think because the weather is nice, I got to go Ohio State. You know, I think last year Michigan caught them in just a bludgeon fest when it was snowing, it was cold, it was perfect. I think Ohio State remembers that and, you know, it's going to be at the shoe and the weather's going to be okay and they've got some unreal athletes on the outside. The other thing that worries me is if Blake Corum doesn't play, I'm not sure Michigan is going to have it in the tank. What about Minnesota, Wisconsin? Minnesota. That Wisconsin team's not very good. I mean, we should have beat them last week. I know that Minnesota dropped one to Iowa. Um, but, you know, I think that is also going to be one of the most boring games of yes. all time to watch of just, yes. I mean, Mo Ibrahim, 363 yards or something crazy last week of total yardage was insane. But uh, Braylon Allen's probably not going to be able to play next week either. I think he'll still be dinged up. So, you know, it'll be the Isaac Rando um, show for Wisconsin. So I think that's going to be another low scoring game, but I do think Minnesota wins that football game. All right. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Mm. Are you a turkey or ham guy? You're turkey. probably both. Uh, I'm a, I love Thanksgiving. I think it's the most underrated holiday of all time. I agree. You get to stuff your, stuff your face, watch football. Like there's nothing better than Thanksgiving meal. I love Thanksgiving. I think it, it and it gets lost because if people are already talking about Christmas, but I love Thanksgiving. Uh, Christmas Wh doesn't go up till after Thanksgiving. That's a rule in the Searles household. What's your favorite side dish to the turkey then? Stuffing. Stuffing. 100% stuffing or You're so basic. A real, like stuffing or mac and cheese. Someone who makes a really like creamy, yummy mac and cheese. But here's the thing, and I may, I people are probably gonna either love me for this or hate me for this. I'm a big just mash it all together on the plate guy. So I'll get the mashed potatoes, the green bean casserole, the mac and cheese, the stuffing, the turkey, the gravy, and then just like you just stir, stir it up it. like a big old goulash. Oh, so good. Oh, that's, that's not, I don't like that at all. What about, <laughs> uh, what about dessert? Pumpkin pie, pecan pie? All pies. Oh. I, I, don't, I don't discriminate. <laughs> I love all pies here. You know, I'm one, I would rather have like a second helping of stuffing rolls than go to the sweets. That's how I am. You can always go back. I mean, there's nothing wrong with going like savory, getting some dessert, sitting on the couch, unbutton the pants, watch a half of football, go back for some more stuffing, more dessert. I like to do the weigh-in. I know Gabe Eichert from Oklahoma used to do this too. Last year I gained 14 pounds. It was a wonderful day. Yeah, no, everybody was excited because we had a home game after it. Yeah. And so we talked about it. So we'll need to track it again. You need to do that again. Oh, yeah, You should it's also happening. sometime like give your like play-by-play, step-by-step guide of how to tackle Thanksgiving meal. Okay, yeah, that sounds like great content. <laughs> We're going to do it. Content, baby. All right, well, Jeremiah, appreciate your time. Happy Thanksgiving to you and the Searles clan. Absolutely appreciate you guys. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone there on the Husky Radio Network. And have fun in Iowa City, people. We will. Destination City.
we're going to try to bring back that W for the last game of the season. And then, Absolutely. hey, it, we're getting really close to being talking about the next head coach of the Huskers. Yes. So it could be a wild couple of weeks, and we will have a podcast as soon as we uh, know any of that information, and, and we'll have all the breakdown for you here on the Sideline Slice. All right, for Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie, and as always, the Sideline Slice brought to you by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Go Big Red. Valentino's, a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else. What started with a treasured family recipe in Lincoln, Nebraska has become a classic Italian tradition for 65 years.